Good afternoon. The inquiry is about to resume. Therefore, please can you take your seats and remain silent. Just to remind you that no photographs are allowed to be taken in the hearing room and your phone should be... Yes, Mr. Williamson, you. when you're ready. Uh, Sarah, Madam, uh, I turn now to my second theme, which is change and its implementation. Uh, we say that the inquiry should be both ambitious and flexible in its approach. Ambitious in the sense that recommendations for change should be wide-ranging and radical. Flexible in that the terms of reference should be kept under constant review. If they need to be widened, then the inquiry should say recommend. <coughs> The inquiry needs to build upon the recommendations of the report building a safe, uh, safer future of Dame Judith Hackett, which was referred to yesterday, which was published almost two years ago. For example, Dame Judith criticised what she referred to as indifference, the primary motive to do things as quickly and cheaply as possible, rather than to deliver quality homes which are safe. Cost should not be the sole or even the most important factor in designing and carrying out building projects. Safety must always come first and be the focus of attention at all times. It should always be the key driver. The change from zinc to ACM was an important instance in this case of the obsession with cost, not so much choosing cheaper materials known to be unsafe, but a concentration on cost at the expense of all else. Another theme running through this broader story is the fragmentation of the construction industry in 21st century Britain. As I've said, no one person or organisation was ever taking responsibility for anything. The buck was passed and continues to be passed, but no one was prepared to say the buck stops here. This issue was raised in terms on the very day the fire occurred by the Grenfell Tower Leaseholders Association, hereafter the GTLA, and these are key questions for the inquiry to answer. RBK 400186 at page 0002, please. 
uh, well, they, are, they said this, is it's widely acknowledged by authoritative sources in the fire brigade that the material of the cladding used by Ryden did not meet health and safety requirements in the true sense, i.e. as a fire risk as it is combustible. The crucial question that we as a residents association have is who signed off that the refurbishment delivered by Ryden in 2016 met all the required health and safety standards and that remains the key question for this inquiry to answer. In this connection, that's in connection with fragmentation, uh, the inquiry should consider changes which have been proposed for the construction industry and those implemented in other industries. For example, the RIBA proposals for a new plan of work for fire safety and the senior managers and certification regime introduced in 2016 following the financial crisis <coughs> in the uh, financial sector. That there is a need for an improved regulatory system and stronger individual accountability has been emphasized by those at the heart of this inquiry, the survivors and bereaved families. In their response to the Green Paper, Grenfell United called for a new system of regulation and an improved system of regulation so that what they described as an account accountability fretwork backed by law would mean that a named person is responsible for people's safety in any social housing tower block. There would be consequence for individuals who prioritise profit over people's safeties. It would mean individual failures could lead to sanctions including criminal liability and even fines or prison. In this connection, our clients support the submissions of the FBU that the inquiry should carefully consider issues such as deregulation and austerity. For example, did manpower cuts to RBKC's building control department or the changed regulatory regime in which it was operating affect its ability to do its job properly with catastrophic consequences? Related to these issues of fragmentation, is the fact that this was, as we have heard, a design and build contract. In a previous era, a project like this would have been designed by a borough architect, employed full-time by a local authority, and subject to limited, if any, commercial pressures. The authority would have engaged a main contractor, and the borough architect would have administered the contract. An alternative procurement route, especially for more specialist work, would have seen the authority engage a private firm of architects who would then have performed a similar role to the borough architect. In more recent times, many public projects have adopted the design and build model and of course the in-house resources of local authorities have been reduced massively or eliminated altogether. Under design and build, there is a danger, as you may well feel occurred here, that the architects once novated are squeezed out of the process. They are, after all, now a cost burden for the design and build contractor. And there is no independent professional person to administer the contract and ensure that the design intent is fulfilled. Now, I've been talking about recommendations that uh, the inquiry should consider, but recommendations are all very well unless they're implemented and unless the implementation is overseen, they are not worth the paper they are written on. The inquiry needs to be very well aware of the history here, particularly of the Lackanal House fire, which various people have referred to. As the Phase 1 report notes, a major fire occurred at Lackanal House in 2009. There was serious loss of life. Six people died. The coroner's recommendations were considered and extensive, and included the need to address the requirements of building regulations uh, B4. Nothing much happened as a result. As the Lackanal inquest was nearing its conclusions, residents at another RBKC estate wrote to the TMO and the council in the following terms. TMO 1003-8714 at page underscore 10, please. On February the 27th, 2013, they said, at the inquest into the lethal fire at Lackanal House, the QC for the families of those that died described the work as a fundamental breach of building regulations, a lamentable failure of the contractor. Could you please tell us what checks and measures you have undertaken to ensure that Apollo, who were the contractors 
hired by RBKC for major works at Elm Park Gardens adhere to the building regulations and that we will not suffer a similar fate. The TMO were clearly giving these issues some consideration in 2013 as the Grenfell, Grenfell project gathered pace. For example, Janice Ray of the TMO noted in May 2013 that, quotes, ensuring effective compartmentation of our dwellings is the only effective way of containing fire and reducing fire spread from the flat of origin. This was further reinforced to me yesterday at a briefing from the BRE on the Lackawan House fire where breaches in fire stopping definitely contributed to fire spread. And in June 2013, Ray prepared a briefing note on Lackanel House, which observed that TMO 1001-6215 at page underscore three, please. Tragically, <coughs> this fire resulted in six deaths, which clearly led to much discussion about the cause, the contributing factor, and most importantly, what action is required to ensure fire safety in high residential blocks. Further, I have also outlined the TMO's current position approach, and one of the matters she mentioned was a review approved document of B of the building regulations, clear reference to external fire spread. And yet, despite all this, and despite the coroner's best intentions, Grenfell saw the lack of all mistakes repeated and amplified. The warning signs were there for all to see, and they were ignored. Most poignantly of all, Claire Williams of the TMO actually invoked the spectre of Lackanel in November 2014 when she wrote to Artelia about the cladding, and that's at ART 3046, page underscore two. She said, I've just been looking at the cladding as our database is asking for costs. However, I don't know if there's any issue of flame retardance requirement. I know at Lacknell House, one issue was that the replacement panelling for the asbestos cladding was not flame retardant, exclamation mark. I don't know if this is in the specification, but want to make sure if it is raised. <coughs> Mr Booth of Artelia uh, passed, uh, having made a quick review of the specification, suggested that uh, Williams pass on that matter to uh, Ryzen. So Claire Williams took this up uh, with Simon Lawrence of Ryden, copying it to Booth uh, later on the same day, and that's at RID, RYD 00023468, uh, where she said, I'm just writing to get clarification on the fire retardants of the new cladding. I just had a lacknal moment. There was no response to this, and neither Williams nor Artelia seemed to have followed this up. Artelia submitted in their oral opening the other day that they did exactly what an employer's agent should do, but what they did not do, of course, was to check that there had been an answer of any kind to Williams' question. This was perhaps the last chance to avert disaster, and it was not taken. The email chain should have alerted all concerned to the fact that there was no fire strategy and there had been no coherent attempt to design the cladding to take proper account of the fire safety issues, but it seems not to have done so. However, this episode is also a warning about the inquiry process itself. However thorough the analysis of what has gone wrong and however trenchant the recommendations, nothing will happen unless those recommendations are monitored and implemented. Thus, in relation to the phase one recommendations, the inquiry needs to consider carefully which of those matters are the most urgent, who is dealing with the required changes, and what mechanism is appropriate for those changes to be implemented. As the panel will be aware, and as Mr Stein referred to, the government is considering its response to the phase one report and is proposing to bring forward legislation. But little has so far happened, and in any event, this inquiry should be proactive in itself monitoring what is being brought forward at a legislative level. For example, John Healy, the Labour spokesperson, advocated a five-point plan for action for the Secretary of State to adopt in the House of Commons debate last week. And the reference to that is House of Commons debates 
21st January, volume 670, column 234. In short, the outcome of this inquiry should not emulate, emulate Dickens' circulation, circumlocution office, with half a score of boards, half a bushel of, bushel of minutes, several sacks of official memoranda, and a family vault full of ungrammatical correspondence on how not to do it, or emails to similar effect. The urgency of the task is not in doubt. For example, Ryden are still working on large public housing projects and were, until very recently, still being allowed to bid for or work on high-rise buildings. There have also been, as Mr Stein referred to, a number of well-publicised fires where the cladding has been a substantial contributing factor. I deal now with my final theme, which is process. Our clients have a number of concerns about the inquiry process. We ask the inquiry team to reflect upon them. The first relates to the evidence and argument which is about to begin. On the 4th of June 2018, at the very beginning of this inquiry, Mr Millett QC has, uh, as has already been mentioned more than once, outlined what was expected uh, from the corporate uh, participants. Uh, he asked that their statements address very specific identified issues, uh, that they provide what he described as a full and clear uh, case. Uh, he said that that course would be pursued with vigour uh, by the inquiry and as has been said many times already he deprecate, deprecated any suggestion any temptation to indulge in a merry-go-round of buck passing however despite those wise words the witness statements from the key players are, have demonstrated exactly that which Mr Millett warned against. They say very little. So, for example, the statements from Studio E are long and detailed and refer to many documents. Others from Exova and Ryzen, for example, are terse and unforthcoming and make little apparent use of the documentation. However, the documents, the witness statements, share a common thread the reader would struggle to extract Mr Millett's full and clear case. None of the witnesses really engaged with the question of how the widespread and fundamental failures identified in the Phase 1 report came to take place. The corporates have indeed elected to indulge in a merry-go-round of buck-passing. No one takes responsibility for anything. Everyone seeks to blame other parties and avoid accepting any responsibility themselves. The duty of candour has been ignored. This process has continued in, into and indeed been much expanded and developed in the opening submissions. With the very limited uh, exceptions of RBKC and Celotex, none of the corporates takes responsibility for anything. They are prepared piously to express deepest sympathy for those affected and to pledge their undying loyalty to the work of the inquiry, but of contrition there is little sign. So, for example, Ryden, the design and build contractor, appears not to have been responsible for either designing or building the works. In his oral opening for Ryden, Mr Taverner QC, used the word delegate or its variants about a dozen times and yet as the design and build contractor Ryden could not in fact delegate responsibility for anything. Mr Tavener also made the point that Ryden were reliant upon the architectural and engineering know-how of others but in truth it appears that Ryden consciously decided no doubt for commercial reasons to marginalise that very know-how. Studio E say that they placed reliance upon Exova's fire safety engineers, and yet they never clarified at the time exactly what Exova was supposed to be doing. They also seek to say that they were not responsible for checking the Harley drawings, but that is exactly what their novation appointment required of them. The deed of appointment 
as novated, provided that Studio E were to seek to ensure that all designs comply with the relevant statutory requirements and they were to coordinate any design work done by consultants, specialist contractors, subcontractors and suppliers. Artelia described in numerous contemporaneous documents which they themselves drafted as project managers were not, it seems, actually responsible for managing the project. Exova, who held themselves out as world leaders in the provision of fire safety services, said, say they had no responsibility for the fire safety strategy for these works. And where there is an admission of failure, it is swiftly accompanied by a deflection of blame in the direction of other parties. So, for example, Harley say in their written and oral opening that the absence of cavity barriers around window openings may not have been compliant with the terms of ADB. However, in the very next breath, they then blame the cladding design drawings of Studio E for failing to specify cavity barriers and Exova and building control for their failure to draw attention to the lack of cavity barriers. Both Ryden and Harley have sought to pass blame in the direction of our comic, <coughs> Celotex, placing reliance upon, for example, the Celotex data sheet, which asserted that Celotex RS5000 was acceptable for use in buildings above 18 metres in height. However, and crucially, the data sheet went on to say, as to certification, and this is CEL 40308 at page underscore three, Celotex RS5000 is a premium performance solution and is the first PRR board to successfully meet the performance criteria set out in BR135. Then explained the system was tested and gave a description of it and then said this, the FAR performance and classification report issued only relates to the components detailed above. Any changes to the components listed will need to be considered by the building designer. We can anticipate, therefore, that these corporate parties, with enormous financial resources behind them, and well-paid teams of lawyers and extensive expert assistants, are going to make the inquiry's task as difficult as they possibly can. And as Ms. Bar Ms. Barwise and Mr. Stein have already pointed out, some of the corporates have underlined this approach by seeking to claim privilege uh, against self-incrimination for their witnesses. All this gives rise to a number of procedural, procedural concerns, concerns which our clients have not had the opportunity to ventilate until now, since there has been no procedural hearing to prepare for phase two. For example, it appears that much of the defence raised by certain corporates in module one will amount to the assertion that they were the innocent victims of misleading claims made by Silatex and Arconic. And yet those claims and those parties will be peripheral to module one, these issues having been reserved to module two. Equally, our clients wish to emphasise the difficulties they had in putting forward supplemental questions in the phase one of the inquiry. They felt that not enough time was provided at the end of examination by counsel to the inquiry of witnesses in order to speak to clients and get instructions for supplemental questions. Subject to questions under Rule 10 of the inquiry rules, this is, of course, the only real avenue for raising matters during the course of the hearings, and we submit that a better system will be required for Phase 2. Our clients are therefore concerned that their much less well-resourced voice should be heard in this inquiry. The question of voice is an important one, because a substantial part of the history of this tragedy is the way in which RBKC and the TMO ignored the tenants at the time. In November 2016, the Grenfell Action Group posted a dramatic but fully justified and prophetic warning. They would have been even more concerned if they had been aware of the litany of incompetence and worse I have described, and that's at TMO 1004, 7933, 
page underscore 001, they said this, it is a truly terrifying thought, but the Grenfell Action Group firmly believe that only a catastrophic event will expose the ineptitude and incompetence of our landlord, the TMA, and bring to an end the dangerous living conditions and neglect of health and safety legislation they inflict upon uh, their tenants and leaseholders. And they went on to say, the Grenfell Action Group predict that it won't be long uh, before the words of this blog come back to haunt the TMA management, and we will do everything in our power to ensure uh, that those in authority know how long and how appallingly our landlord has ignored their responsibility to ensure the health and safety of their tenants and leaseholders. They can't say they haven't been warned. The residents continue to raise concerns about fire safety and RBKC and the TMO continue to ignore them. So, for example, in March 2017, the GTLA wrote to a councillor to say that they intended to hire the independent health and safety inspector to carry out a full health and safety inspection of the premises. That was forwarded to Laura Johnson of RBKC, who responded to Robert Black, the chief executive of the TMO, I'm not minded to agree to this request. I find that the work that the TMO has undertaken is more than sufficient. On that same day, the GTLA asked Laura Johnson, quote, who is going to pay the ultimate price for the anticipated negligence of KCTMO, the RBKC, uh, or the residents of Grenfell Tower. And in April, tw April 2017, the GTLA wrote again to Laura Johnson, referring to a fire which had happened in the building in 2010 due to poor maintenance. And that uh, email referred to a, a, a petition calling for an independent investigation by an independent, independent adjudicator, health and safety inspector, and fire brigade Inspection, inspectors to carry out a full health and safety inspection of the premises. That was but a matter of weeks before the fire. The petition was signed by many residents. It was delivered by hand by Mr Shah Ahmed, chair of GTLA, to Councillor Fielding Mellon and to Robert Black on the 30th of May 2017, only two weeks before the fire. It should be noted in this regard that Mr Ahmed and the GTLA had been raising concerns about fire safety to no avail since 2010. Our clients are therefore, with that history in mind, anxious that they should not be ignored or sidelined in the inquiry process. For example, despite our urgings to the contrary, and as I have said, there has been no procedural hearing to consider how phase two can be, should be conducted, the scope of the map and management of the modules was entirely determined by the inquiry without any consultation with anyone. As part of that process, the issue of engagement with the residents has been put into module three. Our clients have had no chance to speak as to that case management exercise and no chance either to comment on the formulation of the issue which is currently drafted as follows, quotes, Complaints, communications with residents, nature of residents' complaints to the TMO RBKC, adequacy of response to those complaints, adequacy of fire safety advice. However, this formulation does not capture the real issue and does not address the real key to what went wrong with the design of the cladding and what therefore ultimately led to the fire. The real issue is not merely complaints. It is about the ability of those who lived in Grenfell Tower and those who live in social housing generally to have an input into what is being done to their homes. Of course, the residents of Grenfell Tower were not necessarily experts on these materials or regulations, but they were experts on where they lived. And they constantly emphasised the need to give top priority to fire safety in marked contrast to the approach of the TMO and the construction professionals. This is an important area. 
Section 105 of the Housing Act 1985 requires only very limited consultation by social landlords with their tenants in respect of, amongst other things, programmes of maintenance or, or improvement. A stronger legislative framework for consultation might help to avoid another Grenfell. And note that this is not just the wisdom of hindsight. Towards the end of the refurbishment, Councillor Blakeman, an opposition councillor at RBKC, made the following recommendations to her colleagues, and that's at MET 0045750 at page underscore 0002. Uh, she suggested that, that they should ensure that formal collective consultation arrangements are in place at the start of any project, either through a residence association or through a TMO compact, and also that there should be appointed an independent residence advocate with direct access to senior TMO management who can expeditiously collate and progress residents' concern, especially matters of general concern. The failure of RBKC and the TMO to listen to the concerns of the residents was a substantial contributory factor to this tragedy. It must not happen again in this inquiry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Williamson. Well, that completes the opening statements. And at this point, as I indicated yesterday morning, I'm going to hear an application that's been made on behalf of uh, a number of core participants in relation to uh, claiming privilege against self-incrimination. Now, Mr Laidlaw, are you going to make this application on behalf of those who are interested in it? Thank you. Well, take your time, but when you're ready. I ought to say um, immediately, and just before I offer an unreserved um, apology, that I appear, uh, as I know you, sir, know um, and understand for Harley, the corporate entity. I do not represent the Harley witnesses mm -hmm. in their personal capacity, although, as will become clear, I am, in effect, speaking up on their behalf for your consideration. And in speaking up for these individuals who would otherwise have no form of uh, representation, I sincerely hope that this at least will be accepted of me, that I believe it is my professional obligation to do so, however unpopular that may make me and however inconvenient to the smooth running of this important inquiry the consequences are. So my apology, I am very sorry that the application I'm about to make, an application which I understand that a significant number of witnesses will support and their numbers may be added to as the inquiry progresses. I'm very sorry that this application is made so late. I accept, of course, that it could have been made earlier. And I'm sorry that it's bound to cause disruption to the inquiry and that that prospect, as Mr Mansfield said yesterday, has and will cause the bereaved survivors and residents of Grenfell Tower anxiety, distress and anger. For that, as I say, I am very sorry. And as Mr Mansfield also said, the um, BSRs and no doubt the inquiry itself have a major question, and I quote, over why it's been done so late. And whilst I cannot provide an excuse for that, I can provide something of an explanation, which I will, because this is... You do know, don't you, that this sort of question was raised uh, 15, 16 months ago by the solicitors acting for the TMO, and uh, I think the response at that stage was, well, you can't expect us to go to the attorney without some material. 
And the invitation was given at that stage uh, to provide a basis for approaching the attorney. Now, that was only on behalf of the TMO, that letter was written, but we received no response. And yes, since then, uh, all the indications have been that people were essentially not going to rely on privilege against self-incrimination and have not done so in relation to making statements or disclosing documents. So it yes. did come as a bit of a surprise to find that this application was being mooted yesterday. Yes, uh, 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 and I accept that. I in respect of the first matter, um, I, I do now know of, of that correspondence. I didn't know that until very recently indeed. Uh, and, and I accept, um, in terms of the appearance of things, um, the surprise that this has caused. C can I, speaking for myself now, um, just identify the reasons for me at least coming late to this issue? Because it may be that some or all of these reasons are shared by others who support the application. First, seeking uh, to make the best use of limited funding, because I'm afraid we do not have, despite the submissions which were made <coughs> but a moment ago, unlimited um, funds or anything like that. Seeking to make the best use of limited funding meant that after the summer of last year, <coughs> Council, including the juniors who represent Harley, did not return to Harley's case until December. And then, as you will remember, there was much work to be done on behalf of the company to, to meet the orders in respect of the delivery of the opening statement. Next, and this applies to those individuals in respect of whom Mr Hyatt passes adverse comment, there was his report. That had been served on the 31st of October, but I did not see that until December. And as far as the Harley individuals are concerned, the view taken through to that point was that the risk of self-incrimination was low. I had not, by way of example, taken the view, and it's the point that you've made, sir, a moment ago, that the Rule 9 statements provided a year or so earlier by Harley put them at risk. Thirdly, and importantly, it was during the autumn, so in October of last year, that the police interviews involving four of the Harley witnesses took place, they having been notified that they were suspected of having committed a number of statutory and regulatory offences and been interviewed under caution. It also became clear, and I made mention of this point in opening on Monday, that these are the first of a number of interviews which are to be conducted by the MPS. And then four, in terms of the material, which gives rise to the concern that answering questions may expose the individual to prosecution, to Mr Hyatt's report, one adds the service of the opening statements last week and the emergence of the full extent of conflict of in, in interest between the commercial CPs. This is the buck passing, as Mr Millett calls it. And his intention, perfectly properly, of course, on behalf of the inquiry, to explore in examining Harley witnesses by way of example where responsibility lies or is shared. And then finally, with the best will in the world, it does take time to gather and achieve anything approaching a consensus, even amongst a number of commercial CPs. Th that's not an excuse for the lateness of, of the application. As I have said, it could have been made earlier. And I have no doubt that this explanation will not remove the suspicion amongst some that there is some kind of ulterior objective afoot. But I can assure you that that is um, not my purpose in making the application. There's no advantage to me or the company I represent in, as it were, sponsoring this application. The corporate entity can't avail itself of this protection and is not seeking to do so. This is a long-standing protection available only to the individuals 
and those individuals who work or worked for Harley do not, as I've said, have a voice, but will be in peril unless this issue is addressed. And neither is this issue, as I know the tribunal um, understands, neither is this an issue of little or no importance. This is, as you described it, a rule of law and a right that any witness has in civil proceedings when they are at risk of a criminal conviction and possibly of penal sanction. It's also a right explicitly preserved by the statute that governs the conduct of this inquiry. Um, neither, I, I, I'm bound to observe, should anybody think that this issue, had it not been raised before Monday evening, would not have arisen in any event very early on in the evidence. And can I provide an example? As soon as Mr Millett asked, as no doubt the BSR will expect of him, any question of a witness designed to tease out any acceptance of any failure to observe any aspect of the building or fire regulations, we would suggest that the obligation to warn the witness would be engaged. Mr Nadal, can I just interrupt you for Sir. a moment? Um, <clears throat> I, of course, have had the benefit of uh, your having set out this application in writing. Yes. So that I can see the basis upon which it's made, the nature of the privilege which you uh, say exists, and what I have found particularly helpful, uh, an indication of the sort of offences that uh, might be under consideration. But those sitting in the room and those who are watching this perhaps... Uh, elsewhere on the screen won't have had the benefit of that. And I wonder whether uh, you could help everyone by just outlining those aspects of the matter so that people who are listening to you can follow what you're saying and why you're saying it. Certainly. Do you mind? No, no not at all. The, the only question that I, I would raise um, for you to consider was that, having offered my apology, what I was going to do was to identify the more important of the points which arise and then provide some additional references to the authorities and the guidance, hoping in that way that that will at least allow CTI and the BSR teams and, of course, yourself to understand our position and then bring some focus to the points which will be addressed on Monday. And I wonder whether that might be... Well, you, you take whatever you think is the best course, but I think at the moment you have to bear in mind that many of those who are listening to you, yes. in a sense, don't have... They're not lawyers, I imagine, in the main. They don't have any context in which to place some of the submissions you may be Certainly. about to make. So Certainly. I leave it to you, but I think no, no, I'm to understand better yes. what you're yes. saying. Well, can, can I then um, accept that invitation and, and highlight from the um, application the um, essential um, features of, of the letter? And I'll provide paragraph numbers to that document. <clears throat> At paragraph um, six, we identify the fact that many of the witnesses to be called in phase two have been interviewed or invited to attend an interview under caution by the Metropolitan Police um, in respect of a criminal investigation into the fire at Grenfell Tower. We make the point that the nature of the police investigation is broad in scope, is concerned with numerous potential offences ranging from regulatory breaches to the most serious of criminal offences, all of which carry potential custodial uh, sentences. And in furtherance of the primary purpose of this public inquiry, namely to fully examine the matters set out within the terms uh, uh, of reference and the table of issues, we, we write to you, sir, to uh, invite you to consider seeking an undertaking from the Attorney General uh, preventing the use of evidence by witnesses to the public inquiry against them in, a, in any future criminal proceedings. And at paragraph 8, we, we turn to the privilege and we write plainly, without such an undertaking, witnesses will be lawfully and reasonably entitled to rely on the privilege against self-incrimination and to refuse to answer any question if to do so would tend to expose them to proceedings for a criminal offence. 
uh, that privilege having been described as a basic liberty of the subject, uh, and it's recognised by way of Section 21.1 of the 2006 Act, which draws upon Section 14 of the Civil Evidence Act 1968, which is in these terms, um, and these are the important ones. It is the right of a person in any legal proceedings, other than criminal proceedings, to refuse to answer any question or produce any document or thing, if to do so would tend to expose that person to proceedings for an offence. And then we go on to make a submission, which I will extend in, in due course, mm -hmm. that the scope of self-incrimination <coughs> is broad, and I'll come back to that. And at the bottom of paragraph 9, we also make the, or, or advance the submission, that the privilege applies whether a witness has already been charged with an offence or is yet to be charged. And then in paragraph 10, we... Um, suggests that the seeking of an undertaking from the Attorney General is an established way by which witnesses are able to give full and frank answers and permits the terms of reference for public inquiry to be investigated without delay and disruption to proceedings. And we draw, draw attention to a number of recent public inquiries um, where uh, undertakings of a similar sort sought in this case were uh, granted. Um, at paragraph 12, we uh, deal in part with the matter that you raised with me a moment ago. In other words, the previous approach of the witnesses, which was to provide uh, Rule 9 statements without any reference, uh, as you correctly observed, to um, this privilege. And then, in terms of the proposed undertaking, can I go to paragraph 16? And perhaps I ought to read that out so um, all can um, hear what it is um, that, that we, at least, um, invite you to consider um, seeking by way of undertaking from the attorney. And this replicates in, uh, uh, largely replicates the undertaking which was granted in the recent Bahamusa inquiry, uh, and I quote from the document, one, no oral evidence a person may give before the inquiry will be used in evidence against that person in any criminal proceedings or for the purpose of deciding whether to bring such proceedings, save as provided in paragraph two herein. Paragraph two, paragraph one does not apply to Roman I, a prosecution, whether for a civil offence or a military offence, where he or she is charged with having given false evidence in the course of this inquiry, or having conspired with or procured others to do so, or Roman II, in proceedings where he or she is charged with any offence under Section 35 of the Inquiries Act 2005, or having conspired with or procured others to commit such an offence. And then in the balance of the document, we, we set out for you, because I understand the very clear distinction between your work, sir, and that of the police mm. in their parallel inquiry. So there's no reason why you would know about this. I set out, or we set out, some of the offences which are under consideration. The, the point being, a, 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 as you, with your experience, will see immediately, is that the ambit and the scope of these regulatory offences is, is very broad in terms of their structure. Mm. And the offences include Section 3 of, of the Health and Safety at Work Act. So these are the duties of employers and the self-employed to persons other than their employees. So that would obviously apply to the residents of uh, Grenfell Tower. Section 7, the general duties of employees at work. Then Section 33, which is the offence section of the 74 Act. Uh, 36, which is the... Um, Fault provision. Uh, 37 is the offence committed by the uh, body corporate uh, and those who may contribute to that um, offending, being amongst the um, uh, ch uh, uh, possible criminal offences which um, the individuals, or, or sorry, the Harley individuals, have thus far been interviewed about. And um, <clears throat> just to understand where this takes us, um, as far as individual witnesses are concerned, 
I imagine it's section seven that's likely to bite uh, more than section three. Yes, and I would agree with that. Would it be sensible just to read out section seven A, because and, and perhaps explain what that could involve? Certainly. <clears throat> So section 7A, um, the rubric is general duties of employees at work, uh, uh, and the provision reads, it shall be the duty of every employee while at work to take reasonable care for the health and safety of himself and of other persons who may be affected by his acts or omissions at work. And other persons for this purpose would obviously include his fellow employees. Yes, but would it go wider than that? It, it would go wider than that. In fact, in fact it would... It How would, far would it go? It, well, it, it could extend to almost everybody, uh, apart from that which is excluded from the definition of the offence. So would it be your submission that um, an employee of, let's say, Harley, who admitted to failing to do something or doing something carelessly which might affect a resident in the building would be, arguably at least, in breach of this section. Yes, right. and, and it might even extend um, further uh, in the circumstances of a fire to those who were to attend, to, to, to deal with the fire, uh, uh, right. and the like. So it is, it is a provision which is extremely broad in terms of its application. Right. Thank you. And, and uh, I say this, I, I know that the, uh, I know that the um, inquiry appreciates this, this legislation, the 74 Act legislation, is designed with reverse burdens and the like, um, and, and to be risk-based, to be um, extremely difficult uh, legislation in ordinary circumstances for both individuals and corporates to meet. And certainly in a different context, you, you, you would need to demonstrate that you had done all that was reasonably practicable to escape conviction. Thank you. Can I... Um, Th then turn in the hope that this is um, helpful to what are perhaps the, the more important of the points which emerge and as I said to provide some additional references to, to the authorities and the guidance I in the hope that, that on Monday you, you will simply need to hear from those um, who have had so little notice r rather than me or indeed other applicants yes, thank you. Um, again. And I was going to deal, if it's convenient, with, with the following areas, and, and there are six areas. Firstly, the scope of the protection against self-incrimination. Secondly, whether the individuals are at an appreciable risk of prosecution. And in that respect, uh, I can, of course, only deal with the position of the Harley um, individuals. Thirdly, the breadth of the police investigation and, sir, your terms of uh, reference and then the tension that that gives rise to in respect of the protection. Four, the relevance to the issue of, of, of the provision of the Rule 9 statements. Five, the position of the corporate bodies in the context of the present application and six, the broadness of the suggested undertaking. I hope in that way I will deal with the more obvious point ar which arise, and if I have not, then of course I'll gladly um, I'll answer any further questions. So the, the scope of self-incrimination, having given you a, an example of questioning which would undoubtedly lead to a warning as we suggest that there was no obligation to answer, it, it must be recognised as already... Uh, you have in your remarks yesterday morning, that's day three, page one of the transcripts, lines 18 to 20, that the scope of self-incrimination is broad, as we have set out at section nine of the application. But there are further passages in the judgment of Lord Justice Waller in Den Norsk Bank, the reference to which is 1999, Queen's Bench 271, along with further authorities on this point, to which I should draw attention so all have the opportunity to address these, along with the rest of paragraph 9. And the principle we would submit being that a witness is entitled to claim the privilege in respect of any piece of information or evidence on the basis of which the prosecution might wish to establish guilt or decide to prosecute. 
And at page 289 of Den Norsk Bank, uh, Lord Justice Waller observed in these terms, and I quote, thus, it is not simply the risk of prosecution. A witness is entitled to claim the privilege in relation to any piece of information or evidence on which the prosecution might wish to rely in establishing guilt. And, as it seems to me, it also applies to any piece of information or evidence on which the prosecution would wish to rely in making its decision whether to prosecute or not. It applies to any question which forms part of a series of steps towards a potentially incriminating conclusion. And at page 285 of the same judgment, uh, the, the, the Court of Appeal quoted with, an, with approval from a very old authority called Paxton and Douglas. And, and the quotation is in these terms. I find the distinctions between the questions supposed to have a tendency to incriminate and questions to which it is supposed answers may be given as having no connection to other questions so very nice that I can only say the strong inclination of my mind is to protect the party against answering any question, not only that has a direct tendency to incriminate him, but that forms one step towards it. As to the latitude uh, afforded to the witness in this area, there is the judgment of Mr Justice Mann in a case called Phillips against News Group Newspapers Limited, 2010, the neutral citation of which is EWHC 2952 Chancery, with the references in that decision to the very old case of Boys, B-O-Y-E-S, and the more recent decision of the Court of Appeal in Rio Tinto Zinc and Westinghouse Electric Company, that's 1978, appeal cases, 547, and it may be that 574 of that authority will be of particular assistance. At paragraph 23, there's a passage drawing from what is described as the classic statement of, of the relevant level of risk in boys, and that, insofar as is relevant, is in these terms. To entitle a witness to the privilege of not answering a question as tending to incriminate him the court must see from the circumstances of the case and the nature of the evidence which the witness is called to give that there are reasonable grounds to apprehend danger to the witness from his being compelled to answer. Then at paragraph 24 from Rio Tinto Zinc, this, and again I quote, there is the further point, once it appears that a witness is at risk, then great latitude should be afforded to him in judging for himself the effect of any particular question. And I go move on a little. It may only be, and these are perhaps important wo words, one link in the chain or only corroborative of existing material. But still, he is not bound to answer if he believes on reasonable grounds that it could be used against him. It is not necessary for him to show the proceedings are likely to be taken against him or would probably be taken against him. It may be improbable that they will be taken, but nevertheless, if there is some risk of their being taken, a real and appreciable risk, as distinct from a remote or insubstantial risk, then he should not be made to answer or to disclose the documents. But where there is a real and appreciable risk or an increase of an existing risk, then his objection should be heard. And then at paragraph 25, and drawing upon Lord Roskill's judgment in Rio Tinto Zinc, uh, it was said, I think that the right question is to ask that posed by Lord Justice Shaw on Friday afternoon. Can exposure to the risk of penalties, or in other cases to the risk of prosecution for a criminal offence, be regarded as so far beyond the bounds of reason as to be no more than a fanciful possibility? And then drawing that together, this was the view expressed by uh, Mr Justice Mann at paragraph 26 in Phillips, and again I quote, thus considerable latitude is given to the person claiming the privilege and putting the matter slightly quotely, he is entitled to the benefit of any doubt. 
So I turn next to the second of my headings, the possibility of a prosecution, which again is a judgment that, that, that you will have to um, consider. It is clear we would submit that in respect of the witnesses on whose behalf the application is made, that there does exist, borrowing the language from the authorities, a real and appreciable danger of self-incrimination. May I take the Harley witnesses? There is a parallel criminal investigation in existence, and the interviewing of the Harley men has actually started. Four of them have already been interviewed. Those who have been interviewed were interviewed in a way which strongly suggests that further interviews, as one would expect, are to come. Those of the Harley witnesses not thus far uh, interviewed have had no indication at all and nor realistically will they receive one that they will not be invited to interview in the coming months or years and in terms of the duration of, of the parallel police investigation and whether that risk may dissipate or disappear no decisions will be made by the police until at earliest when the evidence gathering stage of the inquiry's work is at an end. So charging decisions are some years away, and right through the course of phase two, these individuals will remain suspects in respect of who there is, we would submit a real and appreciable danger of self-incrimination. Third, uh, the broadness of the scope of the police investigation of the inquiry's terms of reference and the table of issues. Uh, and the question whether it might be possible to limit the questioning of the witnesses at risk so as to remove the danger of self-incrimination, -incrimin which is bound to be an, a, a, an issue that you, sir, will want to uh, reach a view about. This is dealt with at paragraph seven of the application and we make the submission for your consideration that it would be quite impossible without an undertaking from the Attorney General of the type sought for the inquiry to discharge its purposes and to provide the answers to the BSRs which they are plainly entitled to whilst at the same time providing the protection which is a matter of basic fairness the witnesses, as we argue, should be uh, afforded. C can I explain the point? The police investigation is very broad in terms of its scope. The Metropolitan Police have declared either publicly or during the course of the interviewing process they are investigating a whole range of offences, some of which are set out at paragraph 16 of the, applica of the application. The offences, and we've sought to illustrate that by reference to some of those created by the Health and Safety at Work Act means, and this is at uh, paragraph 18, that in practical terms and in the context of this fire, any person who has failed to take reasonable care for the safety of another commits a criminal offence potentially punishable by a term of imprisonment. But the investigation is not, of course, limited to 1974 Act offences, along with the Health and Safety at Work Act, there are also a myriad of regulatory offences created by the building and the fire regulations, some of which, of course, impose strict liability. The terms of reference are, are, are as broken down, and it hardly needs me to say this, and set out in more detail in the list of issues, and of course it's issue four, which, which most closely bears upon the position of the Harley witnesses, are equally and very understandably broad. And the result is, uh, 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 as we submit, and this is the tension that requires resolution, that any question which touches upon or may, in combination with other material, point to responsibility for an act or omission, or which seeks an acknowledgement as to the awareness or not of the regulations or breaches of them gives rise to the risk of self-incrimination. And there's a passage in Matthews and Agaros's book 
Health and Safety Law and Enforcement. It's the fourth edition at paragraph 12135, which puts the position even more starkly to which I should draw attention. Uh, and that paragraph, and, and I'll read it into the record, is as follows. In cases where it is known a witness is being considered for prosecution, or there is a possibility that he or she might be prosecuted, it is arguable that any question he or she is asked, touching on the circumstances of the death, including apparently innocuous ones, such as who the witness works for, or what his or her role in a given company is, may have a tendency to incriminate. This is because in any health and safety prosecution, it'll be necessary for the prosecuting authority to show whom the individual worked for and what was his or her role in the company. So as we um, submit for your consideration, sir, work-related deaths give rise to the risk of prosecution in a particularly acute form <coughs> because of the breadth of the criminal offences which arises in that context. And it is, it is impossible, we would argue, for any witness or indeed the inquiry to know or ascertain which offence might be considered or which evidential gaps might be filled by any question posed at the inquiry. Equally, we would suggest it is difficult to concede of any question asked of such a witness touching on his work at Grenfell Tower which would not at least carry the risk of amounting, and I borrow the words from Rio Tinto Zinc, to, and I quote, one link in the chain, or being only corroborative of existing material. So there is, we would suggest, um, for you to consider, sir, no sensible way of limiting the scope of the questions if this inquiry is to deliver on its promise and to properly explore the issues, which would involve the witnesses being able to speak freely and honestly without the answer giving rise to a very real risk of prosecution. This is the tension which exists, although it is not an unusual situation, as the experience of a number of other recent public inquiries demonstrate. And it is by way of an undertaking from the Attorney General, as we point out, which has become the established way of resolving that tension with the following results. And can I just set these out briefly? First, if there is an undertaking, the witness is encouraged to give full and frank answers, which have been called for, and, as is my understanding, is the assistance the Harley witnesses wish to provide to your inquiry. And as the um, late Sir Christopher Pitchford said, when seeking an undertaking in the undercover policing inquiry, and this is paragraph four of his ruling, and access to this can be gained from that inquiry's website. And I quote, it is a commonplace that witnesses are more likely to be frank and honest with their inquisitor if there will be no adverse consequences to them arising from their evidence such as the use of their evidence in a criminal prosecution. Secondly, if there were an undertaking, it avoids the difficulty which the inquiry will otherwise have to confront, particularly in respect of witnesses who are unrepresented, of seeking to ensure they understand the nature of the privilege and that they make effective use of it. And having regard to the difficulty of asking questions which would not, on one view, engage the privilege, it will also avoid that issue arising repeatedly throughout the course of the examination by Mr Millett and uh, Ms Grange. And that's because in the ordinary way, uh, the witness, if he wishes to rely on the privilege, would have to do so after the question has been asked and before he answers it. And the judge, or in this case, I would have to decide on a question-by-question -question basis whether he should be required to answer or not. Yes. But, but you, which would be a very cumbersome sure. procedure, but that's what it would be. Yes, uh, and you have the point, and the point is it, it avoids the inevitable disruption to the smooth running of the inquiry. 
And then finally, in, in terms of a consequence, and perhaps of most importance to the inquiry uh, and to the bereaved survivors and residents, the provision of an undertaking in the term sought is likely to assist ultimately in fulfilling the inquiry's terms of reference and in providing the BSRs with the answers they seek from the commercial CPs and those who worked for them. And in that sense would be, we would suggest, in the public interest. And the reason for that is this. If the undertaking in its terms is broad enough, that removes, of course, the ability to rely upon the privilege as a way of avoiding answering questions. So whilst it may not have um, the appearance of something which will actually aid the course of the inquiry, my submission would be that on analysis that that is its purpose. Just um, three short uh, topics to deal with. Firstly, the provision of the Rule 9 statements, so, so the point you, you made to, to me um, a little er earlier. Reference was made to that very issue in our discussions with CTI on Tuesday evening, to the provision of the Rule 9 statements, without any concern at that stage being um, raised, or indeed later, about the risk of self-incrimination being raised. And we deal with that at paragraph 12 of the application, as you know, drawing again on Lord Justice Waller's judgment in Den Norsk Bank. It's at page 289. It's in these terms. It's one thing for someone to make a statement to the police or anyone else, which he might afterwards try to retract. It's quite another for him sometime later to be made to repeat any admission on oath in court in the presence of a judge and his lawyers. It makes the potentially retract retractable impossible to retract. If there is a risk of self-incrimination and if there is no bad faith, a no increase in risk must be almost impossible to establish. So, so we would suggest that the fact that a witness has previously given an account in a statement in Den Norsk, it was to the police, does not mean there is no increase I I in the risk if that witness is later required to answer questions about or even to confirm its accuracy under oath. But it, it, it's right, isn't it, to point out for the benefit of others that w the statement that's already been made and signed, I think possibly with a statement of truth attached to it, will still stand as evidence. Yes, it, it is. It may or may not have the same weight as evidence given from the witness box, but it's there still in evidence. Yes, a and in terms of the criminal proceedings would be admissible against the maker of the statement yeah. regardless of any undertaking that you consider to be appropriate. Yes, I, I agree. Um, the position of, of, of the body's corporate, and, and, and I make this submission um, I I in light of some of the assertions made uh, uh, about the lateness of, of the application and that being some sort of device which um, is to the advantage of, of, of the companies. It is important to understand what is not being sought. There is no question of immunity from prosecution for individuals or corporates being sought as was reported um, yesterday and overnight. There is no power to do that. And that is not what the application seeks, as I know that you, sir, understand. The undertaking, if obtained, would simply prevent the use against, and I underline the word, an individual who gave evidence at the inquiry. If there is other evidence against him and a charge is justified against the code for prosecutors, then, of course, he may be prosecuted. Similarly, there is no prohibition on the reliance upon evidence given by a witness against another person if the evidence is admissible. And perhaps importantly, from my position and the company I represent, neither would an undertaking provide any protection to a corporate CP in any subsequent prosecution. The company cannot seek any sort of ruling about self-incrimination and does not uh, seek that. And finally, um, I, I've got the broadness of, of, of the undertaking, because you will want to consider carefully, if you are minded 
to accept the application we make, um, uh, how broad the undertaking uh, should be, and, and whether you should seek um, from the attorney an undertaking I I I in the terms of the proposed draft for your consideration. O on this issue, it might assist to have reference to the note on submissions prepared, prepared by counsel to the undercover police inquiry, which is an extremely helpful document in a number of respects. As I say, that too is available on the website uh, for that inquiry. And it's paragraphs 27 to 69, and the analysis of the terms of the undertakings obtained in many recent public inquiries where this issue has arisen, risen, which may be of particular interest. There are also examples where different approaches were taken at paragraphs 70 to 77. But it may be helpful on the question of the proposed scope of the undertaking that you, sir, are asked to um, consider to read from paragraph 27 of uh, CTI's note in that inquiry. And that is in uh, these terms, uh, and I quote, analysis of examples of statutory public inquiries over the last 20 years indicates that although undertakings have been sought in the majority of cases, it has not always been considered necessary. Where undertakings have been sought and granted, there is an apparent shift from the tendency to seek narrow undertakings aimed at assuring witnesses that there will be there will not be any direct use in criminal proceedings of any evidence they give to the inquiry to a more recent tendency to seek broader undertakings to give assurance against the derivative use of a witness's evidence. The broadest of the, deriva of the, of the derivative use undertakings are at least equal in scope to the privilege against self-incrimination, and importantly these words, and therefore leave no need or basis for reliance upon privilege at the inquiry concerned. And they go on then to deal with um, immunity uh, and the like. But I've drawn selectively from the paragraph so others will have to read um, the whole thing. Um, my position um, in support of the proposed undertaking is that, is that the undertaking of that sort is appropriate for these four reasons. One, the terms of reference in this inquiry and the detail of the issues as set out in the list of issues are broad. Two, the matters to be investigated in order to, dis to discharge the terms of reference plainly, we suggest, indicate that questioning will need to touch on matters which seem certain to engage the privilege, absent an undertaking of the sort. sort. Thirdly, it would be better to seek a broad undertaking in terms of its wording to avoid the danger of too narrow an undertaking being sought, which might leave the scope of privilege still to be asserted, which would not then avoid the problem which we have identified. And three, if an undertaking is to be sought, it should not preclude a prosecution for an offence relating to the evidence given to the inquiry itself, for example, perjury or any other of the offences committed um, contrary to Section 35 of, of the Act, which governs this um, inquiry. I'm going to pause there, because those are the six areas I sought to add to. And if there is, of course, anything else I can deal with at this stage, then, of course, I, I will seek to do so. Well, I just have one question at the moment about the terms of the proposed undertaking. Have you got it uh, handy? I have, thank you. Um, I noticed that the, in paragraph 2.1, uh, the provision is made for a prosecution for a military offence. And I wonder yes. whether that was... Um, that, that's a... I'm sorry, that's, that is an oversight. That's an error. So Forgive one me. could just take out the words in brackets? Yes. That would be... Yes, that, that is a better draft. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And that's an error. Just, just give, give me a moment. Is there any need to ask? Okay. Well, Mr Laidlaw, that's um, very helpful. helpful. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, will you be here on Monday? Yes, I will. Uh, it may be that um, I shan't need to trouble you again.
because you've laid out the case very fully. Yes, I do. And uh, if I may say so, very helpfully, both for me and for those who've been listening. Um, it's right that I should say that the application has been supported by quite a large number of other witnesses or potential witnesses um, and core participants, but none of them asked to make oral submissions in, in support of it. I think they would happily adopt what you've said. That's as I understand it. Yes, that, that is my understanding too. Sir. Um, so I think as far as you're concerned, I just need me to thank you very much for your assistance. No, not at all. As I say, I, I will we'll be see here... where we go on Monday. Yes, I'll be here on Monday as long as you require. Um, well, that would be very, very okay. kind. Because as you know, I've already uh, directed that I will not hear uh, counsel for the bereaved survivors and residents until Monday because to give them, well, essentially to give them a chance to take proper instructions. No, I, I, I entirely understand, of course. And, of course, Mr Millett, who may wish to say something about it, will have to come after them. Yes, of course. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, that concludes the work we have for today. Uh, we don't sit on Fridays, so we shan't be sitting tomorrow. We're going to sit again on Monday. Now, we were going to hear witnesses on Monday, but for the reasons which I think you all now clearly understand, we won't be doing that. On Monday morning, I'll hear submissions from Council for the bereaved survivors and resident core participants and from Council to the inquiry. Uh, and at that point, we'll see where we are uh, and what we do next. I think it's, I can say with some confidence that not only should we not hear evidence on Monday, but as things stand, we shan't hear evidence on Tuesday either. Whether we have to put things back further may depend in part on the outcome of this application. Anyway, thank you all for being here. I look forward to seeing you on Monday. Sir, yes, Mr. Seward. Ask, uh, point of clarification, would, apart from uh, Mr. Manston on behalf of the BSRs, would other core participants be able to... Well, do you want to be heard on this? I, I, I don't think... Well, have you decided whether you want to be heard or not? No, we haven't. Yes, I mean, you, you're in a slightly... Uh, do come up to the desk because you, you won't be on the, on the screens if you don't. Sorry. Um, I, I was very struck by the fact that none of the people whom you support... I mean, members, members of the Fire Brigade's Union um, were at all unwilling to give evidence as fully as they were asked to. Yeah. And I think that's all to their... Uh, that's very much to be commended. Um, whether we shall be expecting to hear from any members of the Fire Brigade's Union in Phase 2, I'm not quite sure at the moment. It's possible because we have got a module dealing yes. with the fire service, but it, I think it's mostly going to be concerned with more senior people. Yes, um, That's likely, but yes. we don't know yet. Well, you might like to consider whether whether you, you have much of an interest in this application. But yes, if you, indeed. If indeed. you think you do, then um, probably it'd be best to hear you on Monday. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And I suppose I should have. Mr. Walsh is over there in the corner. Um, is there anything you want to say, Mr. Walsh? Not at the moment, sir. No, but I may communicate. With yeah, please, please feel free to do so. All right, thank you. Right, thank you all very much. Uh, 10 o'clock on Monday then, please. Okay.